turn and face the cross. We'll start with our call to worship printed in your bulletin. This is the day. On this uh, Sunday where we celebrate uh, Jesus's ascension. It's our last Sunday in the season of Easter before we head into Pentecost. So glad you made it out. Uh, as you can see, our back lights aren't working right now and they probably, as we try to figure out what exactly is wrong, uh, it may take us a few weeks to, to get those working. That just means you all have to sit next to each other and a little further up front. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, let us continue with this gathering song, hymn 365.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, receive us and our prayers for all the world, and in the end, bring everything into your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Sovereign and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we have our scripture read. of the Apostles. In the first book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the Apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power with the, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up towards heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand as we welcome our gospel this morning. Sunday and uh, the, the Sunday before Pentecost that we celebrate next week and the tradition in the church is to read these two ascension stories that are in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. So you heard Sarah read the one from the book of Acts and now I'm going to read the second from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I do want you to remember that Luke wrote both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts and that they're kind of book one and book two. So what Sarah read is a summary of how it ended in the last book that he wrote. 
So if we were doing things in the right order, the way Luke intended, we would have read this one first and then Sarah. So just a gee whiz fact for you to take home and amaze your friends and <laughs> assure them that you did go to church today. Well, here we go. So then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, they must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things. And see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them, and he was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him, and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, may be seated. So when uh, my family, when I was four years old in my family around 1968, we moved to a, uh, uh, from Toledo in the city where we lived to a, a suburb uh, in Bedford, Michigan, right over the state line. And we lived into a, a new housing development that was being built, hundreds of houses. Uh, and it was really an idyllic place to live. And I lived there from about four to about 14, so for 10 years. And, and, and when you think about uh, a childhood. I, I really had an ideal childhood uh, where this place was that I lived. There were, there were these windy uh, suburban roads that they started to like to build uh, that now all of our subdivisions are full of, that we, we could ride our bikes uh, around without fear of traffic. And uh, there were all sorts of empty lots because the, the subdivision was being built while we were living there. And, and we'd use those empty lots to play baseball and football and uh, until the street lights came on and we had to go home. And, and there was a, a copse of woods, my mom used to call it, a, 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 a three, four acres of woods uh, that, that sat behind the subdivision. And we would uh, go in those woods, there were trails that ribboned it, and we would spend days uh, exploring those trails and getting off the trails and finding the creek. And, and we would go and borrow wood from uh, these houses that were being built and, 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 and make forts in those woods. It was, you know, when, if you close your eyes and imagine what has been the closest you've been to paradise, you know, that's something that comes to my imagination. Kind of that idyllic childhood that I had in this place. And I'm starting with paradise today because when the early church started thinking about Jesus ascending to heaven, it was this idea of Jesus returning to paradise that struck their first. This idea of Jesus returning to paradise. And more importantly, that Jesus the Son, flesh returning to paradise. And so that one of the most famous early church thinkers, uh, John Chrysostom, a, a bishop of Constantinople in the fourth century, he wrote this, which isn't going to do anything for you at all, but you're going to listen to it for a second here. You ready? Our very nature, against which cherubim guarded the gates of paradise, is enthroned today, high above all cherubim. So let me uh, unpack that for you just a little bit. You remember in uh, Genesis 3, you probably know this story, right? That, that Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, paradise, is the Hebrew translation. They were, they were kicked out uh, of that paradise. And... and they were kicked out for not trusting God, for not following the commandments of God. And in order for them not to sneak back into paradise after God took God's eyes off of the gates, I guess, uh, God put a, a flaming sword at the door of paradise and made it twirl around so you couldn't get by it, I, I'm thinking. And, and God also took some heavenly creatures called cherubim and, and had them sit as guards at that gate of paradise so that flesh could no longer be in paradise. And so Chrysostom's thinking of that Genesis 3 story when he writes this. Listen to it again. Our very nature, 
What's the nature we share with Jesus? Our flesh, our body, our bodily nature. Against which cherubim guarded the gates of paradise. Those heavenly creatures that are keeping us out of paradise. Is now enthroned high above even those heavenly creatures, cherubim. That the flesh of Jesus didn't just sneak in, like in some Indiana Jones movie, through that gate to, to invade paradise. That that gate's been broken open. And, and that Jesus, the Son made flesh, he isn't just hiding under a bush, hoping God the Father doesn't discover him. He's in the throne room of God. He's next to God the Father. Whatever the presence of God the Father is, what we can be sure of, the presence of God the Son is Jesus. Flesh. Flesh is in paradise again. And, and this idea of returning to paradise is what caught the early church's imagination when they, when they thought of this ascension story. And they shouted hallelujah with that return for this place that was made for us. We are now welcome back into that neighborhood. So John Calvin, about 1,400 years after uh, this guy named John Chrysostom. Now John Calvin, he, he, he was kind of a sober guy, uh, an early reformer that was a contemporary of uh, Martin Luther. And, and, and he read what John Chrysostom had written about ascension, and, 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 and he had some comments of his own about it. And, and he imagined this paradise being a medieval castle, which of course, right, when we imagine what paradise is, we always imagine from our own context, whether that's an idyllic neighborhood in the early 70s or, or whether that's the grandest thing you know, a castle. So he imagined this medieval castle and he imagined God the Father on one throne and God the Son, Jesus, on another throne. And he imagined the very different natures of their bodies, this flesh sitting on the throne in the presence of God the Father in the other throne. And, and, and the disparity of that. But here's where he went with it. He, he said that when flesh then comes before God the Father, and God the Father gets discouraged by that flesh, <laughs> maybe starts to have second thoughts about letting that flesh into paradise, he gazes over to God the Son and the perfection and beauty of the flesh of the Son is a holy distraction for him, allowing us into paradise. The flesh of the Son is a holy distraction for him, allowing us into paradise. I spent the rest of the week just trying to think about what that might mean and whether I even liked that idea. Because I don't think I like that idea. I mean, it, it, it feels as if Jesus is sneaking us in when God the Father is not paying attention, right? Okay, I got him distracted. Now you can come in. It definitely feel, doesn't feel like the way Calvin imagines it, that God the Father is excited about us moving into the neighborhood. Whatever flesh is doing in that neighborhood, we aren't welcome, it feels like, right? I don't know whether we're putting up lawn ornaments that no one likes or, or, or got cars on cinder blocks, but we are taking down the value of that neighborhood. Or maybe it's just that God the Father is thinking, I cannot take one more piece of flesh in this paradise, and then he looks at Jesus and goes, well, maybe this one will be as good as that one. But for whatever reason, it doesn't feel like there's that joy in this holy distraction idea from what Calvin wondered and imagined about the ascension of Jesus and flesh now being in, in paradise. And as I thought about this, I was reminded of a book that was fairly popular a few years ago. It was called The Ark of Justice by Kevin Boyle. The Ark of Justice by Kevin Boyle. And it was a, it was a historical uh, book. It was a true uh, a true reporting of a doctor named Dr. Ocean Sweet, uh, born in the 1890s uh, to a grandson of slaves in, in uh, Virginia, I believe, but born in poverty for sure. And he went to Howard University, the, uh, the, the, uh, the traditional African-American uh, university. And, and he graduated as a medical doctor uh, remarkably, because he was a remarkable young man, and he moved to Detroit, Michigan, 
uh, to start a practice. And he moved to Detroit, Michigan because everyone was moving to Detroit, Michigan there, if you can imagine. This is, this is the 1920s now when this happens. And from 1910 to 1920, Detroit, Michigan doubled in size. You just got to let your mind wonder on that. It went from 210, 215,000 people to almost 450,000 people in 10 years. Doubled in size. And, and the reason they doubled in size, of course, you know, is because of all these automotive factories that they were building and, and, and all the people that they needed in these automotive factories that they were bringing in for them. And they were bringing these people in to work in these factories from all over the world, really. Uh, European immigrants, Eastern Europeans, uh, moved in in droves to Detroit in that 15, 20 year period, speaking different languages and having different religions. And you also had Af uh, African Americans, blacks, moving up from the south. Uh, from places of poverty and whites moving up from the south from places of poverty and, and finding homes in Detroit. But that's the thing. <laughs> they weren't finding homes in Detroit because no city, especially a hundred years ago, could create as many homes as they needed for all these people that were moving in. And you had the, the traditional cultural clashes of these different communities of people that spoke different languages and had different ways of being. And of course you had just plain old racism going on too. So there was a lot of tension when Dr. Ocean Sweet moved into Detroit and he, and he, and he moved in be, for the same reason that everyone else did, because of the opportunity. And he did well. He, he got a job at, at the only black hospital that was in Detroit. And, and he saved his money and he married and he had two kids. And within five years of practice, he bought a house in, in this tough housing market having to pay significantly more money than anyone else on the block where he bought because he bought a house in a white neighborhood on Garland Avenue. And that was the only way he could convince this person to sell it to him. And he definitely wasn't getting a, bank from, a loan from a bank. And that's when the problem started for Dr. Ocean Sweet because uh, black men had tried to buy houses in white neighborhoods before him in Detroit. And riots had happened because of it. And now riots started in this neighborhood in Garland Avenue. Gangs of white people, hundreds of them, gathered around the house and on the block. And, and they threw bricks in his house and they shouted invectives at, at, at his family and threatened them bodily. They pushed and shoved them as they tried to move in and out. Opinions were written in the newspaper about how this can't happen in our city. And other times that this had happened in Detroit in the last 10 years, the man who had bought that house, the person of color, had moved out. But Dr. Ocean Sweet didn't move out. He stayed. And he gathered his family in there, and, and he gathered his siblings in that house. And while these riots were going on around his house, he gave guns to his brothers. And someone shot one of those guns from a window, and a white person was killed and two others were injured. Every man in that house was arrested. There was a huge international trial that, that made the news all over the world. Uh, Clarence Darrell came and represented uh, Dr. Ocean Sweet, paid for by the NAACP. If you don't know who Clarence Darrell is, he's, he's another big name from this time. The monkey trials, you may remember, he was involved with that. Clarence Darrell came, and, and, and he got him off. He got him all off. It was a happy ending. Except it took three years for Dr. Ocean Sweet to move back into that house that he owned outright with a deed. Three years as the city of Detroit fought him against moving back into that neighborhood that he wasn't welcome at. Three years. And when he did move back in, you know what happened. Everyone sold their house around him. And they all left. Because this little piece of paradise on Garland Avenue in Detroit, Michigan, that they had found was now ruined by the dint of Dr. Ocean Sweet's color. And they all left. And that's the story that came to my mind as I thought about this holy distraction idea. 
This idea that God the Father is, is worried that somehow that, that we are going to ruin this paradise. That it's okay just the way it is. And I thought to myself, you know, that's not the story I imagine when I imagine our welcome to paradise. I don't imagine God the Father needing some sort of distraction in order to slide me in the back while he's not paying attention. Because Jesus told a different story about being welcomed into paradise. And it's a story you know because it's one of the most popular parables there is. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And I'm not going to retell that whole story, but I'm going to tell you how it ends. It ends with this son who's been a good-for-nothing piece of work, covered in pig slop, coming home to the paradise he's known, a plantation of wealth. And the father, before he can hardly even get out a word, definitely before he's even repentant, the father rushes down to greet him on the road (laughs) and, and welcome him back to paradise. Runs down and greets him on the road and drags him back into paradise because that boy is flesh of his flesh. And he is thrilled to have him back into paradise. And he welcomes him and he throws him a party, a huge blow-up party, like those high school kids had behind my house at 1.30 in the morning last night. That kind of party. Because the father was overjoyed at this return to paradise. That's who our father is. Our father doesn't need a holy distraction. Because in the throne room of God, I am led to believe by the teachings and the ministry and the love of Jesus that the flesh that is in that throne room now is thrilling the Father with joy. And that joy and grace and mercy comes to us when we enter that throne room before them. You know, as these disciples... We're watching this ascension of Jesus, this thin spot, right, where heaven and earth have kind of buckled and and, and met each other. They couldn't help but take their eyes off of it. And and that makes sense, right? I mean, it had to have been so glorious and and spectacular and, you know, and they just couldn't take their eyes off it. They were just staring at it up there. And in this thin spot between heaven and earth that had come together, you know, things leak back and forth. You know, things get up and things get in, and, and, and Jesus uh, moves into this heaven, and, and, and down are, are two heavenly beings. And, and they kind of do a dope slap on the disciples, and they say, Hey, <laughs> I know it's beautiful, but your eyes are to be down here. Your work is down here. What you're to be about is down here. Take in this vision of paradise that you see now and then witness that vision in the world around you. God's hope isn't just that we get a glimpse of paradise in our life. God's hope is that we share that glimpse and even more so that we work to make our communities a dim reflection of that gift. And I'm just saying dim. (laughs) Surely God hopes that it'd be better than that. But let's start with a dim reflection of paradise and go from there. That's who we're to be about. He tells those disciples to stop looking and to start witnessing what you've seen. And to start creating neighborhoods that are a reflection of paradise. Where all are welcomed and celebrated. And that got me thinking to the paradise that I experienced as a child in the 60s and 70s in Bedford, Michigan. You know, as I thought about it and I thought about Dr. Ocean Suite, I can't remember one person of color in those hundreds of houses that wound around that subdivision. And surely I didn't know everybody that lived there. But what I can tell you for sure is I never had one person of color in any of my classrooms in the 10 years I went to school in Bedford, Michigan. And I would ask adults around me why that was, because, you know, I could see TV. I knew that black people existed. (laughs) And I was told that white people like to live in one space and black people like to live in another space, and that's just kind of the way the world is. Or I might have been told at points that, uh, that, unfortunately, when black and white people 
live together, there's conflict and, 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 and people leave and, and it's better this way. And I was surely told by some of the adults in my life that we don't want black people in our neighborhood because they don't want, take care of their houses like we do. They don't value stuff like we do. And some of them do illegal things. As our neighborhoods were separated. But what I was never told was about Dr. Ocean Sweet because one of the long range results of his trial was that white communities in the Midwest and Detroit and Toledo and Cleveland, they got together and they created covenant communities where you would sign a covenant promising not to sell your house to an African American so that it would stay all white. So that it wasn't just an accident <laughs> or, or people's choices. I wasn't allowed to live next door to Eric Franklin or Keith Marshall or Glenn Harris. They weren't allowed to live next to me. There was a flaming sword and cherubim. Jesus, those angels said to those disciples, stop looking <laughs> and start working. Because what we see up in heaven, this glimpse of paradise that we get in the midst of our lives, that is good and it brings us joy and it should fill us with songs that spark our imagination. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. But the vision of that heaven that we've been given is to be a mirror for us to, to shine on our own communities. It's a given for us to ask ourselves, are we making room for people in our own neighborhoods? People who don't look like us, don't sound like us. Do we believe that our God who created us in his image is excited by each and every one of us who bears that image? Regardless of our race, of our culture, or of our language, regardless of even what kind of lawn ornaments we put out or how big, wild, and crazy we let our gardens get in our backyard. That our God is thrilled. And we are to be people to share that embrace as we imagine what paradise looks like. Have a taste of paradise this morning. The ascension of Jesus' flesh lives in heaven again. Taste the bread and the wine, the food of heaven. And then go and do the work of God. Sharing what you've seen and what you know to be true. To the dim reflection of our communities around us. Let us sing. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away.
shadows of this life have grown bird from prison bars has flown, I fly away, I fly away, oh glory, I fly away, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I fly away, just a thanks for the waters of baptism that have revealed your love and your life to each and every one of us. We give thanks for the bread and wine, the taste of paradise that we can receive as we receive your grace and mercy. Help us, Lord, not only to gaze at our future and dream about the paradise you have planned for us, but help us be people that are creating paradise around us today welcoming like you welcome, loving like you loving, forgiving like you forgive. And may be being made known that all flesh is loved, regardless of skin color, places in the world where they're born, class or race. Lord, we pray for all those who are in danger and in need today, especially for Dayton and the families grieving, Virginia Beach and the families grieving, one from a man-made disaster and one from a natural disaster. Pray for those in the Midwest that are experiencing floods from swollen rivers, for all those in war areas of Yemen and Afghanistan. Iraq and Palestine and Israel. Lord, we pray for those who are on our hearts today, lifting up Kimberly, Meg, Susan, Lauren, Holly, Julie, Karen, Amanda, Jennifer, Roberta, Mac, Cody, Steve, Susie, Teresa, Marsha, Angie Finley, Barb Bauer, and we celebrate the engagement of Kim and Rob. And we like give time for other names to be said loud. Hear these prayers, Lord. Bless us with your presence and make us strong witnesses of what we have seen and heard and felt and know. Amen. sit down and I'm going to invite uh, Sella come forward there you got fee I see Sella come on Ethan there you go and uh, two weeks ago when we took in new members where did fee go that's fine keep coming she's fine <laughs> she knows this church better than you do Uh, a few weeks ago when we took in new members, uh, Sella had actually come to the new member class. Uh, she's been coming for years and years here to Messiah, so I didn't even realize she wasn't a member after all those years. 
Uh, and so I wanted to be sure to, to bless her in the congregation that she's been a part of for, for I'm, I'm not sure how long, but for, do you know how long? Long. Long, long time. So, um, so I, I, would, I would thought that we would uh, first just ask you if, or if you are, uh, will continue to yoke yourselves to our ministry and serve with us and worship with us and to raise your children in the faith as you've made promises to them in baptism. Yes. And to also share your burdens with us and allow us to share our burdens with you. All right. Congregation, let's say a prayer for Salah. Holy God, I give thanks for Salamawit and the good gift that she has been already in our congregation. And for Ethan and Sarah and Fee. Lord, may you continue to bless them as you bless us as we live together in Christ. And Lord, may we be a reflection of your hope for all the world. Amen. All right. If you stand. After a number of years, I present to you our newest, <laughs> our newest uh, family and the brothers sister. Oh, she went to get Sarah. There she is. Here's the other two, Fee and Sarah. <laughs> I guess Fee didn't want Sarah to be left out. <laughs> the peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share God's love and God's peace with Stella and her family and everybody else. Check, check, one, two, check, one, two. Why can't I? I can't hear myself at all. Check, check, that's better, a little bit. But more would be even better. Check, check. to God's kingdom this week. <clears throat> Lost are saved Find their way At the sound Of your great condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name every fear has no place at the sound of your great name the enemy the sun. 
I invite you to stand as we join together in our offertory hymn. As you broke bread with the disciples on the shore, meet us now in this meal. Nourish us to follow you, using our gifts to feed the hungry and tend the weary, and all for your love's sake. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joyful hearts, let us join in with all the saints and sing this unending hymn. God, we give you thanks for your compassion, for your grace, your mercy, and your love, for how you have greeted us with arms wide open in the midst of our brokenness, our hurt, our destructive ways of being. You embrace us and change us. And we see that embrace in how you sent your Son and so we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, 
Our Lord Jesus took bread, broke it, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Holy Spirit, come and strengthen us. Come and fill our hearts with your love. Come and stretch out our arms to open with compassion to build your kingdom as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us be in the power and the glory of our Amen. All are welcome to the table God has set. You may be seated as we have our assistants come forward and then all may come and join in this meal.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Living God, you have greeted us in our brokenness and nourished us with the body of Christ broken for us. Risen to new life with you, send us now to bear your healing love into the wounded world. In the name of our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. I've got just a, a few announcements. Next Sunday is Pentecost, so I hope to see all of you back here for worship um, on that festival day of the church. It, it is up there with Christmas and Easter for the church, uh, so come on out for Pentecost Sunday. There's a tradition of wearing red, so if you wake up on Sunday morning, have had your coffee, and can remember that, Grab a shirt that's red or has red in it um, and come on out and we'll see if we have a splatter of red uh, to celebrate Pentecost. Out in the Welcome Center, you can sign up to be a lector, a reader for the scripture. Uh, if you've never done it, I encourage you to try it out. Uh, we're all friends here, so there should be no like extreme anxiety, right? Uh, we are embracing one another. So uh, we help lead worship in this way. It's a good gift. And then also out in the Welcome Center, uh, there's a board uh, for the VBS donations that you can grab. Um, it helps us uh, to keep the cost down for VBS if you're able to donate items that uh, Betsy has, has uh, figured out she needs for that week. So if you're able, please grab a slip or two from that board uh, and bring those in as a donation to VBS. With that, I invite you to stand for our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you God's peace. Amen. Let us sing. <laughs>
to say these words for the season of Easter. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ is risen indeed! Alleluia! Go in peace and serve the Lord!